thank you, David. Um, I just, I, I want to say about David, he really was an amazing consultant. And um, that movie, Hunger Point, starred Barbara Hershey, Susan May Pratt, and the now incredibly famous uh, Christina Hendricks, who is the voluptuous redhead that's on Mad Men. She was unknown at the time. <laughs> I discovered her. <laughs> She'd be nothing without me. <laughs> okay. Um, I am really delighted to be here, and I, I, I have to say I love the irony. I am a keynote speaker for the 2010 Eating Disorders Association of Canada Conference. I am an expert on eating, <laughs> and I have had almost every eating disorder. So you might just want to line up your couches after and take a number. <laughs> um, I started out as a fashion designer. It was a pretty good one. I was perfectly happy, but then I stumbled into my acting career, and I now know it was no accident. I was a designer for, in a very prestigious shop in the Yorkville area, for those of you who are from Toronto. I was in my early 20s and pretty much open to anything and everything when a friend of mine came in and said City Television was um, opening their doors and were looking for unusual ideas. I walked myself down there and through those doors, I really was young, and suggested to them that they do an exercise show featuring a fat girl in leotards. <laughs> they were very excited. They thought, I'm sure, that it was going to be very visually provocative. It turned out to be much more than that. Um, Dan Aykroyd was my announcer. It was his first job in television, too. <laughs> and for some unknown reason, I have been blessed with a usually flexible body. I can do the splits, back bends, everything. I don't know if I can do it anymore, but I used to be able to do it. And um, I would have pizzas delivered on the set while I was doing my exercises. <laughs> At Christmas time, I would decorate the tree with chicken legs and donuts. <laughs> Hilda de Radner used to come, come on the show because she thought she was fat. And I would have celebrities and lots of guests come on to talk about their expertise, and, and I learned an enormous amount. I really did. I did have a psychiatrist once come on the show. He had written a book about fat people, and it was his hypothesis that we should um, not wire our jaws shut, but just wire our fridges shut. He also said that if you took all of the overweight storage from all of the, uh, if you took all of the fat storage from all of the overweight uh, people in North America, we could heat and light New York City for a year. I offered to do a street. <laughs> or we all call it an emergency generator if it was ever a massive blackout. I no longer remember his name. But if you're here and you're not too embarrassed, put up your hand. Not here. Probably just as well. Um, I'm certainly no stranger to the subject of um, body image, and to that end I wrote this uh, one woman show called Sex, Pies, and a Few White Lies. Less lies, more truth. I actually call it my one and a half woman show, which kind of brings me to why I'm here. Somebody affiliated with EDAC must have heard me on um, CBC Sunday morning with Michael Enright, and they thought I should uh, come here because they had heard me talk about my endless struggle with uh, weight. And they thought I should come here and share my story with you. Uh, I have lived in Los Angeles for the past 25 years. Let me just say, the people are as stable as the ground. Not too much. And you know, almost everyone is beautiful in LA. And if they're not, they will be in a few thousand dollars. <laughs> This is a true story. I was reminded of it by uh, Leora last night that I had told her this story, that when I lived in Beverly Hills, I was walking my dog one morning very, very early, and I saw a large Mercedes or Rolls or one of those cars coming up the back alley, and the front door was just open a tiny bit, the driver door, and, I, and it was still <coughs> driving, and I, I, I couldn't figure this out, and then I looked and I saw that it was a teeny tiny dog being walked from the pass from the driver door. I thought this was pretty amazing. Anyway, as the car got closer, I realized that the driver, a woman, had full facelift bandages. She pulled up to a stop sign, took out her lipstick, adjusted her mirror, 
And I said, better. <laughs> <laughs> that is my LA. Um, I was asked to uh, bring my perspective on how large women are portrayed in the media and what it's like for someone who lives with those images and pressures every day. Basically, I think you know the answer. They don't like fat people. That's the answer. Um, I would expand more on that later. I probably shouldn't use the word expand at various festivals. <laughs> I, I will tell you an early story of my life in, 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 in um, Toronto when I first started out. I was working with Second City and nobody was famous at that time. And I got a call to come and meet these producers who were doing, uh, uh, they were American, so I was very excited. They were doing a big television show and they were interested in me. So I went over to meet this important producer and he said, We've seen your tape, we see your work, we really want to hire you and have you be a regular on the show. Well, I was so excited, I ran back to Second City and basically said, see ya. Um, much to my later regret, when I arrived on the set, I found out that this was the Bobby Vinton show and my job was to wear giant horns, long pigtails, a padded dress, because I wasn't big enough, huge puffy sleeves, giant dirndl skirt, and my job was basically to polka out all the guests, and then they got to make a fat joke about me. When I polka out Don Rickles, his line was, hey kid, what'd you do, swallow a stove? I had the most painful experience of my show business career doing that show. I hated it. I have always made a point of never being the butt of any joke. And there I was on a series with a contract that I couldn't get out of being made the butt of a joke. It was pretty terrible. And I actually broke my contract and quit. And I was in Hawaii when I got a call from John Candy, who said to me, you're not going to believe this. They've asked me to wear your horns and your pigtails and hold out guests. I said, and? He said, are you kidding? I said, OK, so now they don't have that person anymore? We were gone. So that was my one really horrible um, moment in show business. And I haven't had any others, because I just say no to things that are not um, dignified for us. I, I mean, I'm happy to make jokes. I love fat jokes. They can be very funny, um, as long as I'm not the body of them. And nobody should be. I mean, I like them in context, just in case you thought I meant that differently. Um, I was inspired to write and perform sex pies and a few white lies because I have a lot to say, and because comedy is a weapon, a stress buster, a pain reliever, a great way of releasing demons without making people squirm, and ultimately because laughter is a safer way, I think, for all of us to deal with the chips and bumps and dips that we all gather along the road. I come from a dysfunctional family. Is there any other kind? <laughs> Isn't that why you all have a business? <laughs> Here's to dysfunctional families. Um, we all suffer as we grow up. It, it's part of growing up. I say in my show that it took 101 humiliations for me to become the evolved me. So as well as giving you my thoughts and opinions how I came to be an expert on body image, I live of it, um, in many ways it has become my uh, life's work. I take really great pride in mentoring young people and hopefully helping them on their road to self-acceptance. And I hope that I am helping them get there faster than it took me. Uh, much of my play is so directly linked to what this conference is all about that I think I will just read for you some of the scenes and let you see what you think. Both my parents were stepped. No one uses that word anymore. Neither of them was considered fat, simply substantial, much like beef. I was born in Glasgow, Scotland. I weighed six and a half pounds. <coughs> One hour later, I weighed 62 pounds. <laughs> I have no idea what was in that milk. But I have been on a slippery slope ever since. No twisted demons on the inside eating away at me, just me on the outside eating. It's a simple math equation, really. Genetics plus cheese, <laughs> chocolate, <laughs> potatoes, I love them, french fries, baked, mashed, 
roasted, I don't really care, but it all turns into fat. It's not emotional eating. I've had therapy for that. It's just that I like food. We're not talking heroin, just sustenance. Lots of sustenance. And I have been on every diet known to mankind. Low carbs, high carbs, no carbs. Every diet Oprah has ever been on. How can she do that? Um, I've spent thousands of dollars on exercise equipment from the lowly hula hoop to the highest tech hamster wheel. <laughs> I do know how to lose weight. I have done it over and over again. I have a gold star for losing weight. I have a platinum one for gaining it back. <laughs> I have a closet that looks like it belongs to a schizophrenic. <laughs> Skin clothes, fat clothes, and I was out of my mind when I bought that. Um, I actually have no idea what I look like. I think maybe I would rob a donut shop and get shot. And then when the coroner comes, you know, take away my body, it'd be a large chalk outline. Maybe then I'd have some idea of what size I am, was. A little late. My question is this, where does fat go? You deal with this all the time, where does fat go? I'm not a scientist, but I have this hypothesis. I, I believe that these fatums circulate above a hole in the ozone. <laughs> I know you're going to agree with me. Um, it, 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 I think that they circulate about the hole in the ozone just waiting for one bad day. One teeny emotional meltdown, one mini rejection, and <clears throat> there it is. That always finds its way back home. <laughs> it's my mother's fault. I have an appetite. <laughs> Surprise there. My mother was Austro-Hungarian. She forced fed me strudel as a child. <laughs> my father doesn't get off scot free either. Fish. Suet ran from his veins directly into mine. I'm just going to give you a little background on my um, family. My mother was a divorced uh, single mother of two teenage children when the Nazis demanded that she leave Austria. She was a big bridge player and she played with diplomats, movers and shakers, big shots. One of them offered to, to get her a visa to, to Nicaragua. Another one offered to get her a visa to Scotland. Scotland was closer. So she took my half-brother and sister to her, uh, an uncle and aunt's in Belgium, thinking that they would be safe while she went to Scotland to set up their new home. She didn't know she was only going to get one visa. She thought her kids were safe. She didn't know that my brother had been grabbed by the Nazis and taken to Auschwitz. She wouldn't know for three years. Miraculously, both he and my sister survived. When the war ended, she knew she had better find a husband so that uh, she could get her children back and be legal. She found one. The man who was to become my father was a 50-year-old, never married Englishman who didn't know what hit him. <laughs> my mother didn't particularly like my father. In fact, I'd go as far as to say she was allergic to him. <laughs> but she was somewhat appreciative. And my guess is they didn't have Hallmark thank you cards back then, so she slept with him the 